Hi, this is Pablina Papaluca, and I have with me Dr. John DiMartini, one of the world's leading authorities on human behavior, personal development, and on maximizing human awareness and potential, a leadership expert and business consultant with more than 40 published books, most of them bestsellers. Dr. DiMartini, hello from Cyprus. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm looking forward to our interview. So we find in South Africa today at your offices, the DiMartini Institute in South Africa, uh, but you travel more than 300 days per year, sharing your unique teachings and wisdom with the world. And uh, this has been one of your life goals since you were very young, to step foot on every major city on this globe and share your mission, vision, and inspiration. And you say that the universe is my playground and the world is my home. Every country is another room in the house and every city is a platform where I can share my heart and soul. That's beautiful and we have uh, certainly experienced this firsthand in Cyprus uh, three years ago when you have first been here and we would of course love to have you soon with us again to share your wisdom and inspiration and I tell people in ancient Greece we had Plato and Socrates and the modern world has Dr. DiMartini. And it's such an honor to have you with me today. I remember I remember being in Cyprus well. I can still remember the the Bank of Cyprus and also this the major event we did that evening and it was lovely people and it was very inspiring. Well, many things have changed since. <laughs> We're going to talk about this today. You're going to give us some inspiration. Um, because as uh, the same as what's happening globally, we've been going through a, a massive <laughs> Uh, crisis here and everything is shifting so today um, I would like to focus on our discussion on this on this uh, global shift that is happening and um, I want to receive your insights on on creating a shift of mindset in all the areas that you specialize you specialize in business wealth creation relationships communication career spirituality and health so it's like a matrix of things that all link together to lead to success. Um, so do we need to achieve a balance in all these main areas of our life to achieve true fulfillment? And how easy is it to achieve this balance? What is the key to fulfillment? Well, every human being has a set of priorities, a set of values that they live their life by, things that are most important to least important in their life. <clears throat> Whatever is highest on their values, they spontaneously are inspired from within to fulfill. And they love getting up in the morning and dedicating their life to that. <clears throat> different people have different areas that they tend to have as highest on their values. Some are very dedicated uh, individuals that want a great, great family. They want to raise beautiful children. And their highest values is that. And that's what's fulfilling. Others want a great, a great business and want to be a business individual. Others are into social causes. Some are into spirituality and basically doing what they can to bring inspiration or spiritual messages to the world. Some are very much into fitness and some are into uh, uh, having basically uh, intellectual pursuits and pursuing understanding of the universe. And some are just interested in making sure they have more cash at the end of their life than life at the end of their cash. They want some wealth. So whatever is highest on their value is what they're dedicated to. Now, whatever that is, they tend to bring order and organization and mastery to the thing that's highest, and they tend to have a little bit of chaos, and they procrastinate and hesitate and kind of frustrate the things that aren't highest. So we all have kind of a, a hierarchy of values, a set of priorities that we live our life by. Now, in order to balance all of those, that's not an easy, it's a juggling act, because you're trying to put focus on your business, and then you're having to go back and put attention on your relationship, or focus on your family, and then having to make sure you're getting workouts. So the wisest thing to do is to first identify where you are masterful at, where you are inspired and disciplined already, because that's the area where your greatest strength is. And then it's wise to take the other seven areas or other six areas of your life, depending on where you're concentrating your focus, and link it to them. For instance, if you're really dedicated to business, let's say, you want to grow a great business, and that's your focus, and you dream about it, think about it, and dwell on it, and it's your whole life revolves around it. But you're not working out. It's because you don't perceive that working out is going to help you grow your business. If you can perceive that working out helps you grow your business, you'll work out to help you grow the business. So you want to ask the question, how specifically 
is doing the other areas of life where you're not excelling, how specific are they going to help you fulfill and help you excel in the area that you want to grow? So if for some reason business is it, you want to ask how is working out going to help me grow my business? And how is spending time on my business providing me ways and times to do workouts? If you're wanting to have a relationship, how specifically is uh, spending time on the relationship and being with the children going to help my business? If you can see how everything is on the way to what's important to you, you increase the probability of giving attention to all those areas. And the, the real truth is you only have so many hours in a day. But the things that are most meaningful to you is what you want to fill your day with, the highest priorities. Parkinson's law states if you don't fill your day with the highest priority things that inspire you, you'll keep attracting things that are disparaging to you, the lower priorities and distractions. So you have to link things that are lower on your values to things higher on your values to engage and to participate, put those in, to have a more well-rounded and balanced uh, orientation in life. So in my case, you also want to ask the question, because I travel quite extensively, so I ask how specifically is doing my calisthenics, my workout, my yoga, how specifically is it helping me in my mission of being a teacher and serving? If I can see that relationship, it becomes part of my routine. If I don't, I tend to not have time for it. I keep forgetting it. So anything that you would love to incorporate into your routine in the seven areas of life, um, you want to basically link to what is highest on your value because whatever is highest on your value is where you're most disciplined, reliable, and focused. And whatever you link to it increases discipline. And also, if for some reason you want your more social life and you think, well, I don't have time for doing my social life anymore. I'm so focused on my business. Ask yourself, how is spending time socializing, networking going to help my business? And how is, while I'm in my business, how is it helping me open up a social life? Link them together and your breadth, your, your breadth of ability to tie all areas of your life into one focus becomes more uh, inspiring. If you're juggling a bunch of balls, if you look at any one ball, they'll all drop, except the ball you're looking at. But if you focus in the center and find what's common to all the balls, you can juggle them all together. So find the thing that's most inspiring to you, link everything to it, and you'll be able to juggle all the balls and keep a balanced orientation. But don't beat yourself up if you tend to have a slant to one side or the other. Just know that that's what makes you unique. And you don't have to compare yourself to other people. We're not here to be somebody else other than who we are. And we're magnificent the way we are. So. That's one way I, I use that in order to bring a balance in my life. Okay, that's very clear. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, in the planet right now, uh, a big percentage of humans are going through this shift uh, where they become aware that governments and systems are corrupt and not fit for purpose, and they're looking for ways to break free. And we are starting to experience a collapse of systems and uprisings. What do you believe we need to do in order to create a global shift of such magnitude that will change the core of our planet and eliminate these systems that control us through greed, ego, destruction, poverty, war, and disease. And how, how do we create freedom and prosperity for every individual? Well, there's a basic tenet, basic principle that any area of the seven areas of life that we don't empower Somebody's going to overpower us. Mm -hmm. For instance, if we don't educate ourselves, we'll probably live by the propaganda of the people who are running the show. And uh, if we don't uh, do that, then we're basically not thinking for ourselves. We're thinking what we're told to think. If we don't empower ourselves in our business, we're probably going to be told what we're worth and work for somebody else and work the hours we're told. But if we become an entrepreneur, we're not subject to that. If we do not save our money and invest our money, we'll probably end up on social welfare and be told what we're worth at the end of our life. If we don't empower ourselves in our relationship, we'll probably accept less than what we really want in our relationship. If we don't empower ourselves socially, we'll probably be living fear, fearing rejection and be part of a little puppet and part of the sheep instead of a shepherd. If we don't empower ourselves health-wise, we'll probably have the medical profession or some institutional uh, in, in, institute that does health tell us what disease we have and what drug we need to take. And if we don't empower ourselves spiritually, uh, we're probably going to be subordinate to some religious belief uh, or some guru that uh, we may not even find to be true after a while. So any area of our lives, intellectually, vocationally, financial, family, social, or physical, or spiritual, that we don't empower, we are designed to be overpowered, to frustrate us enough to eventually say, you know what, I want to take command and start empowering my life in that area. That's the beauty of it. 
So when we feel overpowered in society, it's because we're not empowered. And the wisest thing to do is to master the art and the science and the philosophy of empowerment. That means it's time to be find out what your real values are and what you're really dedicated to. Because anytime you're focusing on things that are really most important to you, you have the highest momentum building and the highest probability of empowering yourself. The second thing is to prioritize your day every day and make sure you're doing things that are most productive, most self-worth building, most economic and business building. So you're empowering those areas of your life instead of just filling your day with low-priority things that make you feel less. Because those all disempower you. Then it's wise to make sure that we uh, eat wisely, that if we sit there and just eat cheap food, it's not really quality food, we're going to run our health down and we're going to be vulnerable. It's wise to educate ourselves and read at least 30 minutes a day. If we fill our minds with ideas that stand the test of time, we stand the test of time. It's wise to save a portion of our money and make sure that we're not subject to it. So many people think they can't afford to save, but the real truth is when you begin to manage money wisely and save first and pay yourself, the world begins to value you and pay you too. And you start to become wealthier. And if you have wealth, you have more influence and more control. It's also wise to make sure you master the art of communicating and realizing that every human being wants to be loved and appreciated for who they are, not for what you want to make them. And so if you learn to, to appreciate what their values are and communicate what's important to you in terms of what's important to them, you empower your relationship. And the more people you do that, the more influence you have socially. And if you basically make sure that you're uh, doing some exercise, stretching and keeping your body in shape and keeping your mind alert and also being grateful to help you in your spiritual quest and be appreciative of people and of your life. Uh, the more you empower all those areas, the less you're concerned about the powers to be. In society, they found that if everybody is playing a sheep, you end up with wolves running the government. But if people end up empowering themselves, they calm down the wolves and get people more balanced. So the wisest thing an individual can do is empower themselves. The wisest thing a culture can do is to educate themselves and empower each of those seven areas. There's a book called The Balance of Powers that was taught at, at Harvard University. And it showed that the more areas of empowerment that people had, the less government had power over their lives. So it's not that the power of the government is ruling us, it's we're not ruling ourselves. If we don't self-govern and we don't empower ourselves, we're automatically going to get overpowered. So individuals can't blame they have to get in motion and go empower their lives. That's the wisest thing to do. Because the more the masses power themselves, the less these few people, the oligarchies and the aristocracies and plutocracies and monarchies and tyrants and things take command. And corruption just means that we're not taking command and being accountable in our own life. If we do, we hold people accountable. So the wisest thing to do is to go and start to develop your own wealth building. Develop your own entrepreneurial spirit. Develop a consistent education on what's most meaningful to you and become a master of a skill so you have something to contribute and compete in the marketplace with. Make sure that you're inspired and grateful and keep a record of the things you're truly grateful for in your life every day. Make sure you stretch and drink plenty of water and eat wisely and eat only food that's really bringing nutrition to your body and making sure you get adequate rest. Making sure that you're making a network of society and social life because if you don't have a network, you're, you're automatically throwing away your power. That's power. It's the people you know that people you can influence, and make sure you master the art of communicating in a relationship because the stresses at home, if they're not stabilized, they carry over into our work and keep us distracted. And in all areas of our life, we're here to master. So education that helps master those areas reduces the probability of corruption and tyrancies that we demand the reunion. In, in Cyprus, as a result of what's happening, people are rising up and saying, it's enough. We're getting power. This is actually a great thing. This is actually exactly what's necessary. And the more people take accountable uh, for their own life and their own mastery and empower all areas of life, they don't have to worry about the government running them. As I travel, well, I, I never have that to do with my life. Yeah. I mean, we are understanding what's happening, but not so many people are taking action. And uh, how do we if they don't people take, If they don't take action, then they're going to end up being ruled by somebody else. Yeah, so how do, we, how do we inspire people, empower them, educate them on a, on a large scale? I know this is your work, this is your life purpose, uh, this is what you do, but um, yeah, is there a way to awaken many people together? Well, <laughs> it's, it's education. Uh, the greatest teacher to the world is exemplification. So uh, every individual that 
dedicates her life to mastering her life, that literally influences by a critical mass, it starts influencing people. Now in South Africa, I've been blessed to be able to contribute and participate in also education. So at the grassroots level in the youth, we're teaching them how to be engaged in their education so they expand and empower themselves for the sake of that. So it starts in the youth. So we have to sometimes work on projects, sometimes it take a whole generation. We have to start the next generation. <clears throat> so teaching children on how what's important to them and what their highest values are, finding out what that is, linking curriculums of education to that so they can learn about how to empower their lives, teaching teachers how to be inspired to teach so that it gets them engaged even further, and building a, a next generation of empowered individuals is essential. Because sometimes the people today that are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s are like the old dogs that don't want to take on new tricks. But the youth is where the next generation comes in. So we have to target the, the youth and the mothers, because mothers that are educated have a little, fewer or less children, and they're more powerful children in the process. So we have to educate. It's, it, I don't know any other way but education and grassroots effort and initiatives at bringing people uh, tools and, and knowledge about how to empower their lives. This is the key. Mm -hmm. So we need to change our education system, basically, for the next generation. And it's about, about prevention, not looking for the cure now. It's about creating prevention for the next generation. And yeah, uh, yeah. and so you would you would create a change in the in the basis of the education system with with the things that you said. What what, we, what we, kind we, of changes do you believe are necessary in the education system as it is now? Well, let me give an example. I was just speaking to 160 teachers the other day here in South Africa, and one of the ladies that helped ordinate, organize and coordinate this event uh, came up to me and said. From your three other talks in a particular area of South Africa in Johannesburg, in a place called Alexandra, um, the pass rate, the matric, matric pass rate was 27%. That means 27% out of 27 people out of 100 that were going to school finished high school. Mm -hmm. She said, now that you've initiated the methods that you've done on how to get kids engaged in school and teachers more engaged, the matric pass rate went to 97 percent. That means we have a higher percentage of people in a matter of months. This is this is one year. In one year, the number of people that are finishing school and educating themselves and getting going out into the world with a high school degree at least has gone up tremendously. So that you can make a difference, you just have to be willing to go out there and do grassroots efforts consistently. Do that. And then what happens is you build momentum. Other, other organizations see that that's happening. I just got asked to speak now to a PTA of about 400 teachers and, and parents now in another country because of this. So it just starts, the ripple effect starts happening. So you don't want to sit there and go, you can't make a difference. You have to find out what you're inspired to do. And even if it's a small thing, go and make that difference. Take action, make a contribution. And when you do that, through exemplification, you inspire other people to do the same. And a ripple effect starts happening. You can make a difference, but you have to have a vision of seeing that difference. I believe it's possible. I'm blessed to be able to help participate in it. So people have to believe in a possibility and not come up with it. We don't empower ourselves by being victim of our history. We empower ourselves by being masters of our destiny. Mm -hmm. And lead by example. Yep. Well, today the majority of people uh, in the world work on a minimum wage and are taxed heavily and they're basically slaves to the system uh, that is controlling us. Um, how do we break free from this system and, and create more of an even playing field so that the majority of the human race who are employees have more of a chance of uh, abundance and uh, move out of this poverty vibration that we're into? now, most people living below the line. Okay, so, that's a good question. When I was nine years old, I went to my father and I asked my father, uh, I, I said, Dad, I want to make more money. I want to buy baseball. I want to buy a glove. I want to buy a bat. I want to play baseball. Uh, what can I do to earn money? And he said, son, um, have you mowed the yard? Yes. Have you edged the yard? Yes. Have you swept the sidewalk? Yes. Have you cleaned out the gutters? Yes. Have you trimmed the hedges? Yes. 
Have you cleaned out the garage? Yes. Have you shined my shoes? Yes. He said, son, you've done everything that I need, so there's nothing I need, so I can't get you money. I can't just give you money for nothing. You have to earn it. So I suggest you go to the neighbors and see if you can find somebody you can serve them. So I went down the street, went up and down to the doors, knocked on the doors, and asked if I could mow yards, clean, clean garages, sweep streets, whatever it would take, and I started earning money. And my dad taught me that there's never a lack of money to somebody who cares about another human being to serve them. So if somebody's on minimum wage, that's because they're limiting it themselves to what they can do to other people and serving other people. So if, you, if you're in a, a situation where you're earning a minimum wage, that's only because you're playing minimum in your life. You've got to give yourself permission to find a talent, a service, a skill that can touch more people's lives and get out of your comfort zone and out of your fears and get out there and find a way of serving more people. Even if it's within the company that you for, what can I do? If you went to the boss and said, I would like to never get something for nothing, what can I do to earn more money? Can I take on two jobs? Can I take on new skills? Can I read a book and learn new things? Can I go to do education? What can I do to help serve the company more and gain your confidence and look around you? Because the only person that's poor is the person who's not caring about another human being to serve their needs. Because if you serve people's needs, there's wealth. When I ask people, how many of you ever use Microsoft Windows? Every hand of them that's in my audience. That means that somehow Bill Gates created a software that everybody could benefit by. Everybody has creativity and innovation and capacities. So go out of your way to dig inside your brain and find out what skill, what talent, what service, what ideas you can provide some human being to get out off our butt and get out and find people to serve. And you'll get money. There's no limit. If you're on minimum wage, it's because you're on minimum activity. If you want to get out of minimum wage, become an entrepreneur and go out and find a way of serving more people. The world's not going to do it for you. Nobody's going to get up in the morning and dedicate their life to you. Nobody's going to get up and make you wealthy. It's you. You're the one that has to decide, I'm not letting anything stop me. You have to have a cause bigger than your own fears to get out and serve people. There's three things that make wealth in the world. The calling to serve vast numbers of people. A willingness to raise the standard and value yourself because until you value you, nobody else will. And the appreciation of what money is because money is a means to the being fair exchange between two people that are basically exchanging goods and services. So you want to appreciate what money is offering. It has a value to people. And people who don't know how to manage it try to negate it or become greedy for it. The people who know how to manage it understand that it's just a measure of fair exchange. If you serve more people, you serve and receive more income. So my, my advice is to go and find out what skills you have and what you can do to serve the world. And the more people you serve, the greater the wealth you'll have. And uh, mostly become an entrepreneur usually, you know, to be able to do this. The more entrepreneurial you are, the less the big companies run the game. Yeah. The greater, yeah. The number, the greater the number of, uh, if, if you cut down a big tree in a field, grass, herbs, bushes, and, 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 and plants grow in and take over the tree. If you don't grow small enterprises, small businesses as entrepreneurs, everybody will work for the government or work for big corporations and they'll play disempowered. They have to believe in themselves, believe in their ideas, and care enough about humanity to get out of their comfort zone and serve. Mm -hmm. Well, about entrepreneurship, I think uh, what stops most people is fear and belief in, in themselves. So what do we need to do to inspire and empower people today to eradicate this fear that they have within them so that they can truly follow their dreams, become entrepreneurs and leaders and put their futures in their own hands and basically take control of their own destiny? It's a lot okay. of fear. So how, how do we make people more self-reliant? Good. Well, great questions you got. Um, Any time you set a goal or an intention, that is not aligned to your own true highest values. You're setting goals that aren't really things you're committed to. And when you do, you'll tend to procrastinate, hesitate, and frustrate. You'll tend to not take the same initiative. You'll tend to, whenever challenged the curve, want to give up. And you'll end up beating yourself up with what I call the ABCDs of negativity. Anger and aggression, blame and betrayal, criticism and challenge, despair and depression. 
The ABCDs of negativity that occur in your mind towards yourself occur whenever you set goals and are in. Whenever you subordinate to somebody else and give power to the government or power to a big company or give power to them and blame them and then feel like I've got to be something else, you're automatically not setting goals that are focused on what's important to you. The first thing to do is find out what truly is important to you, find out what service you truly have, and concentrate on the highest priority, most meaningful, most important, most inspiring things that mean a lot to you to get onto it. That's where you'll excel. That's where you'll educate yourself. That's where you won't give up. That's where your skills will be most recognized. That's where you grow your greatest self-worth. That's when you set goals that aren't going to be uh, fantasies that are going to lead to fears. That's where you're most confident. That's where your self-worth maximizes. And that's where you get noticed, recognized, and make the biggest difference and wake up your leader and genius. So being true to yourself, anytime you set a goal that's not yours, you beat yourself up and you live in fear because you've set a fantasy. We're not here to live outside our own dreams. We're here to be clear about our dreams. So often we compare ourselves to other people and think and compare and think, well, they have more than us, this and that, instead of comparing our daily actions to our own dreams. You want to ask, what's my dream and what are the highest priority actions I could do today to move me one step closer to that dream today? And every day I do that, my dream becomes more profound and more powerful and more realized. But if you sit there and put energy on comparisons or setting goals that aren't yours because you're minimizing yourself to other people, you're holding yourself back from doing the most powerful things to empower your life. Fear is a feedback system to let you know you're not being authentic. The second you're authentic, you don't have time for fear because you're too busy with action. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know one of the most important things is helping people finding what their true purpose is and what they value most in life. And this is your work and this is my work. And I think it's, it's very important because most people don't know what is important for them. And that's why they're lost in fear. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I, on my website, drdmartini.com, there is on the menu on the left side a little section that calls Determine Your Values, Value Determination. Mm -hmm. If they hit that and they fill in their email, we'll send them a free booklet on how to determine their values. This would be the perfect place to start to empower their lives. Because if they don't even know what's important to them and they're wandering around in lost little puppies, they're not going to empower their life because leaders know who they are, what they're committed to, and how they're going to get there. So the first thing is to identify what their highest values are so they can set goals that are meaningful and are true to them so they can be authentic. Well, I, I, I highly recommend it. It was the first seminar I did with you in San Diego. It was uh, around three hours. It was a value determination. It was life-changing. So I highly, highly recommend it to everyone. Um, I want to uh, get your opinion on productivity now something that is bugging me and many people. Uh, in a world with, which has changed the past 50 years in such a fast pace with all the technological advancements and everything around us is moving so fast. Uh, we have numerous constant distractions like social media, mass media, uh, oversupply of information. What can we do to heighten our aware awareness and create more focus on the areas that are truly important in our life uh, so that we can reach our individual goals more easily and not get lost in all this clutter of information overloads. Okay. There is a lovely book out there called The One Thing that I can highly recommend people to go and consume. It is about how important it is to identify what is truly most important to you. Now, I had learned about this, uh, not about that book, but a book that was similar called The Time Trap by Alec McKenzie back in 19... 081, 82. And this was a big turning point in my life because I was basically filling my day with low priority things and distracting and overwhelmed and felt like I wasn't getting things done. I got the time trap. I realized that it was up to me to prioritize. So every single day it's wise to maybe get a little index card or maybe on your computer and sit down, close your eyes, think about what you're grateful for because if you're not grateful for things you're holding yourself back. Think about what you're grateful for, because anything you're not grateful for is baggage, anything you are grateful for is fuel. So sit down and think about all the things you're grateful for, and when you have a moment of gratitude, maybe with even a tear in your eye of so much gratitude, you ask inwardly, what are the highest priority action steps, the six or seven highest priority action steps I can do today 
that will allow me to move one step closer to my primary objective or dream. And you write them down, and then you make them, and they have to be daily action steps, not weekly or monthly, daily actions. And then you go and get those done. And you do not go to bed until all of those six or seven things are done that day. And every time you do high priority things, and don't and fill your day with high priority things, you don't have time for distractions. You say no to distractions. You can't let the world on the outside dictate your destiny. As I said in the secret, when the voice and the vision on the inside is louder and more profound than all opinions on the outside, you master your life. So if you don't fill your day with high priority things, you fill up with low priority distractions, and you're going to be overwhelmed by trivia. So you have to basically say what is important. You have to fill your day with it. You have to prioritize it. It has to be daily actions that you get done that day, so you reward yourself, not long goals that you never get done and you keep stacking up goals. Only actions that day. Because every day you do that, you move one step closer towards confidence and getting things accomplished. It's also wise to take everything that's on your mind, write it down, and ask, is there anybody I can delegate this to? Because you may be doing low priority things and it's wise to surround yourself with delegation people. If you don't delegate things and you keep doing low priority things, you're going to keep lowering your self-worth and holding yourself back from great achievements. You will only grow as far as you prioritize, you streamline things, prioritize things, and delegate things. And if you say, well, I can't afford it, then you don't understand that delegation does not cost money. Delegation makes you money because it frees you up to do things that are more productive, that produce more income to allow you to become more of a leader. So don't let the world on the outside. If you have time for social gossip, that means you really don't have something to, to really to focus on. The only time I would use social media is when I'm doing something that's serving people, not trivial stuff. You want to use the social media as a tool to accomplish something great in the world instead of just gossip and just talk about trivial stuff. Fill your day with things that are meaningful and you have a meaningful life. Fill your day with things with priorities and you have self-worth. Fear things that are productive and produce income and you have wealth. Don't let small talk make stop you from big dreams. And every day, reward yourself for doing that by saving a portion of your profits so you can let your piggy banks become piggy banks. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a question that comes uh, from interacting with my corporate clients, which are some of the biggest corporations in Cyprus and also some smaller companies. Uh, so most of big uh, corporations today in my country and all over the world, they're faced with uh, the collapse of the financial systems and business as we knew it, and are having to readjust their strategies to sustain growth. A lot of my corporate clients are realizing that they need to change the core of their procedures and introduce a new set of values in their corporations. They're realizing that they need to shift their mission, change perceptions, processes, and innovate. Uh, so what, uh, how would you advise the people who manage these large or smaller organizations during these difficult times to lead their people and their organizations so that they triumph through this period of change? Good question. Do you have some fabulous questions? The first thing to know is that if you're in a business, you're in a corporation, um, you need to find out what's the mission of the corporation. What is your primary objective, your mission and vision that you have for this company? And is it real? And does it match the world today? You want to make sure that the leader is inspired by something that's truly here to serve. You can't fake that. And the second thing you need to do is find out what the world's needing. That if you have a product, a service or idea that nobody needs, there's no business. So you have to care about the customer. The number one thing that's the focus is serving a customer. So you have to go and communicate with the customers right now. You can't presume, you can't be, this is actually a great thing that's happening, even though you may not see it right now. It's forcing people to get entrepreneurial, it's forcing people to get back to the basics, it's forcing people to go and care about human beings because there's no business if there's no fulfilling of human beings' needs. And it's making people get prioritized of what's really important in their business and what, who, what really matters. And it's the customer that matters. And it's, it's fulfilling a mission of serving the customer that matters. And if we go back to that basic and find out what they really need, we always have business. And if you're not resilient enough to adapt and change, then you deserve to fall because you're, not, you're, you're too stagnant. You're holding on to past fantasies about how the, life, the world's supposed to be, and the world is changing constantly. 
Our resilience to the change in the world is essential for us to grow our business. We have to be willing to renew ourselves and re-innovate ourselves constantly. So we have to care about the customer because the customer is moving around with new technologies. All of a sudden, things that once sold don't sell anymore, and once services don't aren't needed anymore. So you have to be have foresight, not just hindsight. You got to look into the future. What are the changes occurring? How to be adaptable, prepare for the changes, and keep the customer at the, the, the cutting edge, the front focus. Because if you're not serving them, there's no business. So you can't assume, you can't presume, you can't project assumptions. You need to go in there and find out what their real needs are and how do you serve them. If you care about the customer and you make a relationship with them and you find out how to fill what their needs are, even if it means you may not get a sale today, but you'll build a relationship for tomorrow, tomorrow when they need your services, you've got a service to provide. So you have to care about them and find out what the real needs are. When there's an economic recession, there's always some business that booms. As, as I said, when, when the tsunami occurred in Phuket about 10 years ago, there was a devastation. But bicycle tires went out the roof. Bicycles went up out of the roof because everybody had to ride bicycles at work because the roads were shut down. Tires were, were, went out the roof. There's always some business in every situation that booms. If you don't have the resiliency to be able to have in your portfolio or in your skill base the ability to serve new needs, you have to have enough resilience and skills and get teams together to help people, whatever the needs are. So you have to keep at the forefront, not be reacted from hindsight, but for foresight to keep the needs in your, in your thinking process. This is what research and development is for. And you have to care about the customer. You have to care about the customer. You have to care about the employee. You have to care about the vision. If those three things are in place, your business is going to adapt and change. And, uh, and, and it's, uh, the big, big companies that got too heavy and got too stagnant, they had to decentralize, break down, break up into different things, outsource things, build new entrepreneurs. That's an essential component of every cycle of economy. It's essential. That's what bursts new entrepreneurs. That innovates. That creates new things. gets people off their butt, gets them out of comfort zones and security and dependencies, and makes them more autonomous and empowered. It's really a great thing. And in the next three years, this so-called challenge is going to be seen as one of the greatest turning points. You'll see it. Mm -hmm. So how do we um, help corporations around the world decide and embed the new core values that uh, are necessary in this shift that we're experiencing to, to, towards a better world? How do well, we... Every human being has a, their own unique set of values. There is no universal value system that everybody has other than to love and appreciate each other. So you have to, it's not that your corporation has to have values and that's what the, everybody has to have. That's an archaic system. That's not real today. What they call, the leader of the corporation has to identify what their values are and has to learn how to communicate their core values of the company in terms of the managers, the executives. The executives have to learn how to communicate in terms of the manager's values. The managers have to look at the workers' values and the workers have to look at the customers' values. You have to be narcissistic enough to want to go after what you want in life, but altruistic enough to care enough about another person to serve their needs. So it's not about getting one value system, and that's what the whole company needs to have. That's, that's antiquated. That builds a tyrant and will recycle the same problem that you've just run through. You have to learn to care enough because everybody has a unique fingerprint-specific value system. You need to be able to communicate in that value system and serve those needs. That's where you do it. If you help other people get what they want, you get what you want as a company or as a leader of a company. Mm -hmm. And how do the leaders of organizations nurture people so that they become better and more inspired employees and have the company's interest at, at heart? I think you said communicating with their values, but I'm talking about all the people in the company. Well, engagement is the name for this. And engagement is basically a person never goes to a company to work for a company. They go to work to fulfill their values. Mm -hmm. If they feel that the job description and the vision, mission, and primary objectives of the company is helping them fulfill that, they feel engaged. If they can't see how what's important to them is being fulfilled by working there, they're not engaged. And when they're not engaged, they, they participate in addictive behaviors. They want distractions. They want coffee breaks, tea breaks. They want to look at porn. They want to look at the Internet. They want to go off. They want to take vacations. They want to get away from work. So engagement is the most important thing to increase productivity in a company. And engagement is about helping find the right people with the values that match the job description 
and making sure that we're communicating as a leader in terms of those values when we're delegating things and asking them to for projects to be accomplished. So the leader is the one who cares about the people, knows their individual values, just like a teacher teaching kids. If the teacher doesn't know the kids' values, it won't know how to keep teaching the kids' values. The, the leader has to know the values of all the people down below that he's delegating or she's delegating to to be able to get them engaged. Engagement is the key. If we get a higher degree of engagement, I worked with a company in Japan recently, and in the last year, one of the leaders that came and learned my method on how to determine values and how to link the job description, the vision of the company to the values of the people, that individual rose in the company, he then taught five other ones, they rose, it took another 15, they rose, and now they're going to 50, and they're all rising, and the company has expanded and reached heights it's never reached in one year because of engagement. And this is the key. Any company that's forgetting that, they're not caring about the people. They're making assumptions, and they're not really caring about the people. And the people is not just the customer. It's the customer, the employees, the managers, and the leaders, all of them. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a final question um, on relationships, because you're also a relationship expert. And so most people today do not seem to be able to create and maintain um, healthy relationships, uh, strong relationships that last in the long run. Uh, how can people form more pure and healthy relationships, a relationship of compassion, love, truth, honesty, transparency, uh, one full of uh, the above the line positive attributes? rather than the negative, below-the-line attributes of uh, an emotion based on ego, possession, anger, jealousy, manipulation, fear, and abuse? Um, well, first of all, every relationship, for, all relationships start within us. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a part of us that builds ourselves up and we exaggerate ourselves and puff ourselves up at times, and we think we're better than we really are. And then other times we beat ourselves down and put ourselves down and minimize ourselves. And when we don't, when we exaggerate ourselves or minimize ourselves, we're not being ourselves. This is a, a state of lack of self-governance within ourselves. When we have a balance and we're not exaggerating or minimizing ourselves, we have what is called a poised equanimity state. We're authentic now. When we're authentic, we have the most powerful place to position ourselves for a relationship dynamic. Now, if we exaggerate ourselves and minimize our partner, we'll talk down to them, we'll have carelessness, we'll project our values to them and expect them to live in our values. But they want to be loved and appreciated for who they are. Their highest values is who they are. That's what they're dedicated to. So if you talk down to them and project down to them and look down to them with carelessness and expect them to live in your values, you automatically undermine the relationship. You're automatically going to be a dictator trying to get them to do what you want. That undermines the relationship. That makes alternating monologues in dialogue instead of dialogue. If you minimize yourself and you exaggerate them and you talk up to them, you're in carefulness. Now you're walking on eggshells because you have no equanimity. And you're minimizing you, exaggerating them, and you're sacrificing them, which eventually builds resentment and eventually it undermines the relationship. And you're not able to say, and you repress yourself, and you're not able to be open and communicate with this person. The only relationship that sustains is one that's caring, not careless, not careful, but caring. That's the one that keeps the ring on the finger. And caring means that I honor your values and I honor my own. And I can see and ask the question, how is what you're dedicated to serving me and how is what I'm dedicated to serving you? If I can see how each is serving each other, I respect him. When I respect him, I don't talk down to him or talk up to him. I communicate with a dialogue. This is the first step. Now, there's an exercise in my book, The Heart of Love, which is a book on relationships, uh, on how to do that. So you first got to determine the highest values of the person you're in a partnership with, find out what they're dedicated to, then do the same thing on yourself, what you're dedicated to, your highest values, and ask how specifically is what they're dedicated to serving me. If I can't see it, I'm going to want to change them and fix them, and they want to be loved and appreciate who they are and their values. So they don't want to be fixed. They want to be loved. So if I can ask how what they're dedicated to, how is it serving me, and I keep answering that question until I'm grateful for them being the way they are, when I'm grateful and feel love for them the way they are, they turn into who I love. But if I'm trying to fix them, they get resistance, because nobody wants to be fixed. They want to be loved. 
if I can find out how what I'm doing is dedicated and serving to them, what's helping them, I'm able to communicate like I would do a customer. I'm talking in terms of their values and helping them get what they want. If you do that, stable relationships occur. But going to vacillate. Nobody's going to stay completely centered all the time. You're going to have moments when you're going to be high and low and things of this nature. There's always perturbing. So it's not realistic to expand always peace, never war. Always kind, never cruel. Always right, never wrong. Always kind, never, you know, nice and never mean. That's unrealistic. So you don't want to set an unrealistic expectation because it's wiser to know that every relationship has oscillations, hopefully not extreme, between peace and war, nice and mean, kind and cruel, give and take, generous and stingy, uh, altruistic, narcissistic, everything is there. Every relationship offers all sides. Now, if you allow it to go to one extreme or the other, it becomes unmanageable. It's too, un it's too volatile, there's no governance. But if you learn how to respect somebody and balance out the equation, that's why I teach the Demartini method to help people balance the equation and reduce the conflicts and put them back into respect, you stabilize relationship. And this occurs whether it's your child, whether it's a partner at work, it's whether it's a partner at home, or whether it's society, it doesn't matter. It's the same laws governing relationships. That's why human behavior is so wise to master and learn because it gives you an advantage in the world by knowing that, your human relationship. If you talk down to your customer, you're not caring about their needs. If you talk up to them, you're going to give away your profits. But if you have equity between you and them, you maximize sustainable relationships and build wealth. And so this is the key in relationships. But you can't start out with a fantasy thinking that you're always going to be peace and always going to be happy, always going to be nice, because you can't even do that in your own life. If you didn't even have anybody around you, you couldn't maintain that. You're going to have volatilities. You want to be realistic and know that if you want to help them get what they want to get in life, they'll help you get what you want to get in life. This is what sustains relationships. Mm -hmm. But at attracting healthy relationships and relationships that are more uh, in line with who you are is, is about uh, being true to yourself and no. not unless underestimating yourself. Unless you're willing to be your authentic self, don't expect to get somebody that matches you. So okay. everything that goes on in your life, in all seven areas of life, is a feedback to help you be authentic. So the more authentic mm -hmm. you are, the more equanimity you have, the more inspired you are, the higher the quality of the relationship you're going to have. It's that simple. If you're devaluing yourself or overvaluing yourself, you're going to get somebody in there to let you know that. So the wisest thing to do is to learn to love and appreciate yourself with equanimity. When you do, you have a more respectful and equity relationship with the people around you. So the, all that's happening around you is a feedback to try to get you to be yourself and to break your fantasies about how people are supposed to be. One fantasy is they're supposed to live in your values. Not going to happen. Another fantasy, you're going to live in their values. It's not going to happen. But learning how to communicate your values in terms of their values, that can happen. That's the mastery you want to have master in your life. Thank you. Well, I could sit here and talk with you for hours. I enjoy this so much, but we we don't have uh, so much time. So I'm gonna close this interview. Like a final question, a uh, more general question: What are is the key or the keys to creating more abundance for everyone in the environment that we're living in today? Well, um, if you're talking about financial abundance, or you're talking about just abundant feeling. Financial abundance, I believe, is important for everyone, but abundance in general, in all okay. parts of life, getting rid of the lack. Every human being lives by a set of priorities, a set of values, like I said. And when I ask people how many want to be financially independent, everybody puts their hands up. Mm -hmm. When I ask people how many of you are financially independent, 99% of the people put their hand down. So that means 99% of the population live in a fantasy that they're going to have financial independence, but only 1% accomplish it. The reason being is very simple. The one percenters that accomplish financial independence are the people who value serving people, so they have a source of income. They value money, and they save it and invest it, and they value themselves, because they believe that they're thinking long term. The immediate gratification will cost wealth. The long-term vision and savings and investments will build it. So the person that really truly wants to have wealth building and have money working for them instead of them having to be a slave working for it are the people that save today or tomorrow. They don't wait and keep spending their money on immediate gratifications and consumables and depreciables and trying to buy things to make them feel better about themselves. 
they save a portion, they pay themselves first, and they let their money begin to work for them. And they're patient, methodical, and they're consistently developing their wealth over time. The second you pay yourself first, the world begins to. The second you value yourself, the world begins to. The second you invest in yourself, the world begins to. But until you do, you're always going to have things erode. With Parkinson's law in place, if you don't fill your day with high priority things, it fills up with low priority things. So too, if you don't spend money on investments and savings to build wealth, it will automatically get eroded by unexpected bills and things that are consumables. Consumables are quick fixes, but they don't have any lasting value. But actually saving and investing makes the money work for you. And you never raise your lifestyle until you raise your savings equal amounts and your taxes equal amounts, so that way you work towards financial freedom and independence. Because if you keep raising your lifestyle and you never do your savings, you'll never have financial independence. And most people don't. 99% don't. Because they don't realize there's a science behind it. And if they apply the science, they'll get the results. And now when it comes to abundance in life, there's nothing ever missing in our life. We're just not, we're not recognizing the form things are in. Everybody has wealth in their life. They have intellectual wealth, they have relationship wealth, spiritual wealth, they have uh, physical beauty wealth. There's wealth all around them. But unless they convert that into something that serves people and package it in such a way, they won't have financial wealth. They've got to take their talents, their skills, their, their, what they have to offer the world, and package it in a way that it serves another human being to convert it into cash to be able to be able to have the fortunes that they desire. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your time today and your wisdom. And I'm very much looking forward to meeting you again soon in all of your amazing events somewhere in the world and hopefully in Cyprus soon. <laughs> well, I would um, thank you. I'd truly love to join you back in Cyprus. I look forward to the day we do. I, I have a very great memories. I have a master plan book, my state of the mission book. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, your, your mother, your family, the people, the pictures are all in that book. I remember we went to that special restaurant that, that first night. Uh, in that Fish little town. <laughs> and, uh, I have a memory of everything. I can see it. I know we went to the ruins. We went out towards Limersaw. We went out to the ruins. We went to that resort. I remember every detail of that. that Thank uh, you. And I look forward to the time I get to re return to Cyprus. That was a very special and memorable time for my life. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, it was very special for me too and transformational. It was transformational spending this time with you. And we'll definitely have you back. <laughs> very well, I look forward to it. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Send my love to everyone. Bye. Bye.